Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details. Welcome to Hong Kong Confidential. I'm Jules Hannaford and I'm your host. I'm an Australian woman and I've been living in Hong Kong for many years. I'm a mother, a teacher, an author, and I want to share my wisdom and the wisdom of others with you. Thanks for joining me and I hope you enjoy the show. You meet someone online and there's this instant connection. It's amazing how much the two of you just seem to click. They live somewhere far away, and there's some plausible reason they can't travel to meet you. They tell you they're in love with you, and you feel optimistic for the first time in a long time. They have a successful career, yet somehow they need money from you to solve a short-term problem, always with the promise of paying you back. Time goes on, and they need more money more urgently. You've started to see the cracks and begin to wonder whether they've been lying this whole time. All of a sudden, it hits you. You've been scammed. Fool Me Twice is the story of my mother, Jules Hannaford, a woman who was drawn into the dangerous world of sweetheart scams. After a trip overseas to meet a stranger, a dangerous altercation in a Manchester hotel room, and thousands of pounds lost for good, she's here to tell her story. Fool Me Twice, a true crime podcast, is available on Apple Podcasts, Oscast Network, and anywhere you listen to your podcasts. Today I'm here with Charmaine Chan. Hi, Charmaine. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi. Yeah, I'm glad to be here today. It's exciting to have you here. Before we find out what area you work in, tell me a little bit about what is a medical social worker? Social worker work in different settings. They work in wide range of organizations or agency. And for those who work in the hospital, we labeled ourselves as a medical social worker. I worked in Singapore, one of the hospital there, as a medical social worker for six years. Okay, awesome. And can you just explain the difference between HIV and AIDS and how is it transmitted? A stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, which is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus. So HIV itself is a virus. When a person got infected with HIV, the virus inside the body, then it will attack the immune systems in one's body and make the white blood cells decrease. As we all know, white blood cell is our soldier in our defense systems. Whenever we have the virus or bacteria attack us, our white blood cells fight back. But when the HIV virus attack our body and there is no treatment, the immune system keep on decreasing and decreasing and decreasing. And at the end stage, the end stage, the immune system is really weak and it goes to the A stage. A lot of opportunity infections, for example, pneumonia or TB will attack one's body and they cause death. And that's why in the old days, there's no treatment to treat the HIV virus, to control it, and it leads to a terminal illnesses. But currently, the situation is definitely different. How did you find yourself working with people living with HIV in Singapore? Over the six years there, I spent two years, two, three years, around two to five years, but two to two years or so in the HIV settings in a center called Communable Disease Center. It is very special because in the acute settings, we, I myself deal with a lot of day in, day out, inpatient, outpatient, and in the acute setting, the patient changes all the time. Whereas in, in the Communable Disease Center, the POHIV, the patient with HIV, they are our regular patients. They come in every six months to apply for some sort of funding or assistance. So I see their progress. I see their changes along the way. And some of them are quite impressive and quite unforgettable. That's awesome. We'll hear some of those stories later, hopefully. 
how did you get an interest in working with HIV and AIDS patients? Very interesting because as a medical social worker, I worked with public hospital, we got rotation. I worked with different settings, different departments before cardiology, internal medicine, et cetera, et cetera. And I just got rotate into the communicable disease centers. And it is not my own very preference, but I wasn't really against it. It was a good experience. And then have you just stayed working with HIV and AIDS patients since? Yes, I think since then I worked in Singapore for that particular settings for a couple of years and I moved to Hong Kong and then I also went into the HIV setting. Wow, that's amazing. (laughs) As a medical social worker, what's actually your role? Are you kind of there for emotional support and looking after the mental health of the patients or is it more than that? For the things that you, you just said, the mental health and the emotional support is definitely part of it. I would define my work in Singapore. The first layer would be more on the financial assistance and the discharge planning, more on the case management area, because when a patient went into the hospital, for example, they got a surgery, the doctor and nurses will look at the surgery, how it recovery. How was the treatment like? But it is just related to the illness. Actually, when there was a surgery, there is a loss, some sense of loss. And I think as a medical social worker, when it is to go in and provide emotional support to that kind of loss, uh, that is the emotional aspect of it. Okay. You're working with the patients while they're going through treatment and giving them emotional support. And then you help them with their reintegration back out into the community and making sure that they've got somebody looking after them and they've got support. Is that right? Yes, correct. At some points of that is besides looking into the illness, we also look at their family support, financial support, resources all around the patients to make sure he or she can go back to the community and can integrate to the community. And do you think that people living with HIV have a, they face more of a social stigma and discrimination and possibly even have higher psychological and emotional stress? Well, yes, definitely. When you talk about stigma and discriminations, definitely there are existing in the society. I think it's two ways. When those persons who are infected with the HIV, they become marginalized. So people will have bias on them. And at the same time, I myself, from my working experience, I feel quite, sometimes quite hard heartedness when they stigmatize themselves. They perceive the stigma from themselves. They, they see themselves, they're not worthy. They discriminate themselves. So I think that is quite hard. That's so sad. Yeah, I can understand that. So not only do they suffer from discrimination and stigma in society and from other people, they also put it on themselves. That's very sad. But do you think over the years, because HIV came out, well, not came out, but became sort of well-known and prevalent in the mid-80s, and now we're in 2020s, there's got to be a greater understanding and less fear surrounding HIV now than there was back then? Or do you think that the discrimination and the stigma is still just as bad as it used to be? There is some sort of improvements along the years, but there is still stigmas and bias, discriminations in the society. When I receive calls from the clients and they ask questions, for example, is HIV transmitted via saliva? And if I use condom, would I be infected with HIV? Sometimes I still feel like the education uh, in the public is still low. Yeah, absolutely. And while we're on that subject, can you tell me how HIV is transmitted? Let's clarify that for the listeners. Yeah. Okay. So there are three main ways of the transmissions. So the first one is by sexual contacts that's involved semen, precum, vaginal fluid, or blood. 
And the second one is direct blood contact, particularly through sharing of the infected drugs needles, accidents in healthcare settings or transfusions of blood or certain blood products. And the third one is most people got confused is HIV can be transmitted from mother to baby before and during birth, uh, breastfeeding. Yeah, there's two ways. Yeah. So okay, great. Is- it's not passed by touching or coughing on somebody or sharing saliva or kissing or any of those things. And that's a really good thing for people to understand. Right. And obviously, people with HIV can still be sexually active if they take precautions and they use condoms and things like that. Is that right? Yes, correct. There is a term called undetectable equal to untransmittable. And I would like to introduce these terms because when one's got HIV positive, if they've gone under treatment and the viral load got suppressed it to an undetectable level for six months, the research actually showed that it cannot be transmitted to another person via sexual contact. You're right. If a person, the viral load is suppressed it, and then it cannot be transmitted to the other person. And there's also a drug available, isn't there, that HIV patients can take so that they are able to somehow not transmit it during sexual contact. Is that right? I think I saw this on television. Are you referring to the PrEP? Yeah. Yeah, the PrEP, yeah, right? That's yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, you're very knowledgeable about that. <laughs> I saw it on a documentary or something I was watching. <laughs> PrEP is a preventive medication. HIV was a terminal illness a long time ago, but with a lot of investigation, currently in the whole world, the drugs is very advanced. The treatment is really good. And some patients, most of the patients take one to three pills per day to control the viral load. And the scientists discovered that one of the HIV medications can act as a um, preventive medication. The persons can take the drugs prior and after the sexual activities to prevent HIV. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's so interesting. Yeah. I knew I'd seen it somewhere. Yeah, I know that when HIV first was discovered in the early to mid 80s, many people lost their lives because they didn't have the treatment programs that they do now. And now the antiretrovirals are just so much better than they were. And obviously, Taking only three pills a day is amazing compared to the cocktail of drugs that they had to take in the early days and many of them made them more sick and things like that. So it's great to see that advancements have really been made. Would you say now that most people can live a fairly full and happy life even if they have HIV? Yes, definitely. I mean, if they take the medications daily, and they can live as anybody else in terms of employment, in terms of social activity, diet-wise, is not much difference. And I quote one of my ex-patients in the hospital. He accepted his HIV status, and he shared with me, he's like, yes, I have HIV. It is a chronic disease for me. I come in to see doctors every half a year, to take my medication and they did all the checkup on me. I think I am quite healthy compared to the rest. I mean, uh-huh. he, he, he said it as a joke, but there's some truth to it. Yes, because people with HIV do really take great care of their health and their well being. So they're probably yeah. better off and than some people out in the community who don't look yeah, after their health. Yeah, and they had <laughs> like checkup every six months or the blood check. It's a joke, I would say, but. Uh, yeah, so it, I get what you mean. It's, great. <laughs> it's really great that he had that attitude as well. That's such a positive attitude to have. And having a positive mindset can play such a big role in staying healthy, can't it? We were talking a bit before about the discrimination and we mentioned the lack of education of people in the community. Why else do you think that people with HIV and AIDS get discriminated against? HIV and AIDS are associated with death very closely and people still believe that HIV equals to death and in the old time in Hong Kong there is a triangle shape that talk about AIDS and it is an 
advertisement is like if you got HIV or AIDS and then equals to death. It's very related. And secondly, HIV is closely associated with the disapproving of behavior. For example, sex work, drug use, prostitution, a lot of negative labels, even like gays, homosexuality, a lot of negative labels that are associated with HIV and AIDS. And I think because of all these bias and labeling that cause the discriminations and stigma, and plus HIV is closely related to sex, which is a taboo for the generals to talk about it. And, and therefore, when we push the public education, it may not be that easy. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it's important that we point out that it's not just homosexuals or drug users or prostitutes or people from the groups you were talking about that have HIV and AIDS. It can be anybody from any walk of life. And I think that's part of what we need to do as an education program is make people understand that. In fact, my understanding is that the homosexual community are taking so much care and preventative measures that the numbers are dropping significantly in the gay community and they're rising Mm. in the heterosexual community. I don't know if that's true, but I read that somewhere. And I just think that we often stereotype, don't we? And those stereotypes can be wrong. I pull some facts from the Department of Health. It's just the, the stats since 1984 until 2019. In Hong Kong? In Hong Kong only. Okay, yeah, yeah Kong, great. Okay, yeah, yeah this will be yeah. interesting. The peak of the HIV cases was in 2015. It had 725 new recorded cases for that particular year. And since after that, it's gradually decreased. First, slowly, each year we still got around 600 plus cases per year. And it just, in my view, is because of some preventive measurements has kicked in into these HIV preventive global movements, for example, PrEP and self-testing. And that's why the number has slowly dropped down. But you're right that the heterosexual male figures remain almost the same for the past few years. Interesting that the peak of cases in Hong Kong is 2015, whereas I'm just looking here and the peak of cases in the US was in 1995. I think that's really very interesting and it could be linked to something to do with education and awareness in Asia or I don't know. It's just interesting. Yeah, yeah, interesting because the graph that I have is the accumulative numbers. It's continuous rising, rising since 1984. Now, I'm just actually not sure that I've given exactly the right information (laughs) here (laughs) because I'm Googling on the fly. It It has up and down throughout the 90s. Yeah, it does say 1995 in the US. Yeah, it's just my observations. I've been to some conference and hear some scientists talk about the journey of the shower treatments. Because for the past 30 years, even WHO sent out different guidelines of how to treat HIV. I think that difference actually makes the numbers of the HIV infected cases difference. I think currently the treatment is once you diagnose with HIV, you should get treated ASAP. Whereas before, they will wait until the white blood cell drops to a certain level, low level, and then you start the treatments. I think the difference in treatments leads to difference of the infection numbers. Very interesting. I also think it's probably got to do with education and advertising programs and things like that. And maybe AIDS and HIV awareness came a little bit later to Asia than it did in the US, where I think the first cases of HIV originated. That might have something to do with it. Like I remember in the mid 80s, there was a television ad in Australia about AIDS. And it had the Grim Reaper bowling a bowling ball down an alleyway and killing all these people and children with the symbolic killing with the virus. That still sticks in my head, even, you know, 30 years later. I think those kind of campaigns really shocked the nation into making changes. And I'm sure the US had some strong campaigns in the 80s as well that really shocked people and educated a bit more. 
I'm purely speculating. I have no idea, but I have just double checked and it's 95, 96 was the peak of the AIDS mm, virus mm. in the yep. US. So it is interesting that it's later here. It's different. Yeah. yeah, because the first case is Hong Kong was in 1984. It was a few years later after US. Yeah, because it was yeah. about 1982 in the US, wasn't mm. it? Or one. Oh, interesting. Or 82. How do you think we as a community can break this stigma and this discrimination? What can we do? Well, I think the first thing is we need to equip our long life to understand what HIV and AIDS are and to know more about it, understanding the treatment of it, what's the nature of it, and maybe hear some story about the people living with HIV, read about their story, read about what the experience are. There is a way of learning to accept different things. Yeah, absolutely. And I think also through education programs in school, I think that's really important as well so that teenagers get to understand about it as a part of their education programs. The sex education is very important. And one of our team is working on the sex positivities and to educate the youth to talk about sex. And because sex and HIV is very closely related, I mean, that is part of the work that we are also doing to increase the knowledge and attitude. How good is that? You're working with AIDS Concern now in Hong Kong. What sort of work do you do with them compared to the work you were doing in the hospital in Singapore? Well, it's a very different. When I was in Singapore, I majorly worked with patients who are the people living with HIV, they got infected with HIV already. And where I am in AIDS Concern as a program manager, I work with general publics of majorly key populations because my main role is to run the clinical operation in the testing center for the key populations, which includes MSM, stand for men having sex with men, heterosexual men, I think minority, I think that these are the, the, the key groups that I'm working with. And we do a lot of preventive programs, preventive works on education for the general public. That's excellent. That's really, really great. I'm so pleased to hear that that's happening. Shaman, can you share a story of somebody who you've helped and has made a great impact on you? I've thought about it <laughs> when you ask. I would like to share this one patient that I work with in Singapore. They gave me a lot of insight because when I was a social worker, I usually did a lot of casework in day-to-day spaces. However, this patient, he gave me the insights like I'm not only working on casework, I also need to do a lot of advocacy work. The story was like he was jobless for a while and then he found a job in the semi-government settings as the customer service associate. He was really delighted, very happy. And he called me and said, hey, I got a job on one day. And the second day, he called me again. He's like, I don't think I got the job. I was like, why? You signed the offer letter already. And he told me that because when he went through the body check, they found out that he's HIV positive. And when he write on the application form that if you have any chronic illnesses, he declared no. But it is quite obvious for me to think that if HIV positive patient, if he answered yes, then he wouldn't even get a chance for interview. Therefore, he risked the chance by saying no. My senior social worker and myself were a lot with a lot of talkings with their HR and raised this issue up to different stakeholders. And then eventually he got the offer. Oh, I think that's it, great. That's a yeah. great story. In the whole process, it's feel like, yes, I take care of your emotion. I take care of your financial, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, client or patients, they still need empowerment to work on themselves. My work is more than just supporting oneself. It's really looking at a bigger picture, doing a lot more advocacy, fighting for equality. Do you find this work emotional or stressful for yourself personally? 
because you must be dealing with quite a number of stressful situations or tragic stories or having to give a lot of emotional support or helping people fight their battles like this guy for the job. So do you find it stressful or are you okay managing it all? I think as a working woman, I feel the stress. But once I'm off work, I had good self-care. I love to do sports. I love to do yoga and, and running. So I think that part, um, I'm quite okay. I feel like as part of my job, it's like I usually shared it with my client. It's like when you step into the room, it's like a dustbin. You can throw all your negative emotion, your words on it. And when you walk out, you feel lighter, but you still get the problem. But I'm really here to grab that for you for a little while. Oh, that's really nice. And I think that there's a real message in that, that if you have somebody that you can share your problems with and that you can work through strategies of how to deal with them and have that kind of support, it can really, really help you. Even if you don't get a solution or an answer, just working through things with somebody else can be a huge, huge support. Yes, correct. And not only like people would say, oh, you should show you help people, but actually I learn a lot from my clients, from my patients, and to understand myself a bit better throughout the whole journey because sometimes I even I'm not aware of some bias I hold on to until my clients get me some certain feedback. And it makes me to reflect on my own value, my own journey. And it makes me grow. And it's a mutual process. See, that's really nice. And it just shows how lifelong learning is such an important part of all of our lives and that we can learn from our children. We can learn from our clients. We can learn from our students. You can learn from your patients. There's so much that we can learn, which is really, really nice. Charmaine, do you know which countries have the highest rate of HIV and AIDS in the world? Or are you only kind of aware of what's going on in Hong Kong and Singapore? Yeah, I did a little bit of search. Oh, thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, from the Google, it said it's South Africa. Oh, okay. Uh, Yeah, South Africa, I got the numbers 7.5 million people living with HIV. Wow, that's a large number, isn't it? Oh, that's sad to hear. Are antiretrovirals readily available for people in Hong Kong or do you have to have money to be able to get treatment? Well, in Hong Kong, it is heavily subsidized by the public healthcare systems. If you go into public hospitals to get treated, it is in a very low cost rate. Isn't that great? Hong Kong's got such a fantastic medical system. We're so lucky to be here and to have such access to such incredible doctors. Like There's so much skill and talent here in the Hong Kong medical fields. Yeah, and part of our service is to escort the patients to the hospitals to provide support because people got diagnosis in the testing center. They're not sure what to do and they cannot tell anybody. What uh, some of our colleagues do is to provide support immediately and link the person to the public health system to make sure the patients get the proper treatments and lower the viral load. And do you do any support work with the family of the HIV patients? Yes, 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 of course we do. Only with the consents from the patients. But yes, we do. I think that part is another whole story. It's very yeah. important, isn't it? I'm sure it plays a huge role in families embracing and supporting and accepting mm. their HIV patient or their family member who has HIV. Do you see people from all different nationalities in your centre or is it predominantly Chinese people that come and seek support? In our centre, we usually have the local people, the Hong Konger, but we do welcome all the people who live in Hong Kong to come up for testings if they fall into the key population groups. Fantastic. And do you do the testing at your centre? Yes. Oh, right. Rapid okay, test. Cool. We do all the men having sex with men. We do HIV rapid test, syphilis, and also hep C. All other screening tests. And if let's say there's a positive result, all we need to go through a confirmation test after. Oh, right. So yeah. yours is just the initial test and then it's got to Correct. be confirmed. Are you ever involved in revealing to somebody that they've had a positive diagnosis? Oh, yes. What's that like? Is that difficult? 
you ask a very good question because I face with a lot of patients throughout my medical social worker time. But when my first time to look at the result appeared to be positive, I myself was numb. And because it is a result that for the clients, it will be forever. And you got to have that calmness to tell the client, this is the result. And what steps are we going to do next? And in that environment, still holding and supporting him or her and to journey with him or her. I remember I was shocked. I was numb. That was the first time. Even the second, the third time, it is still the same. Because when you saw the line just pop out, it wasn't nice. But you still need to remain rational and, and calm. Absolutely. And then I guess you've got to be prepared for any kind of reaction from just no reaction to complete breakdown or deep grief and sadness. Do you find that everybody reacts very differently to the news and you've got to be prepared for different situations? Oh, yes. They come in very different emotions. For the past cases that I have, they are quite calm because they anticipated that they had a high risk of sexual behavior. And that's why they prepared to have a positive result. But still, when you saw the line, they still got shocked. There's one step before the actual testing is called pre-test. We did prepare the clients the worst first before we pluck their fingers and do the test. We'll ask them, what is your risk level? How do you think, how likely is your risk? We prepare them to have the psychological preparations. That makes sense. That's a really good idea, actually. Oh, gosh. And you talked about the prevention programs that you're working on. Can you talk a little bit more in detail about what they involve? Like, are they programs in schools? Are they community programs? Are you reaching out to certain groups in the community? Yeah, in Ace Concern, we divide it into different program teams. One team manage the MSM, one team manage the ethnic minority, and one team manage the heterosexual men and youth as well. So every team has their own target key population and they will develop, for example, social media campaign, different outreach programs for different key populations. Let's say MSM. As a testing and counseling, we cooperate with them to do outreach. We go to the bar to do testings for the clients, whereas youth team will go to school to do education programs on HIV and AIDS. So different right. teams do different programs and strategically target their audience and to achieve the uh, effective outcome. Oh, wow. That's so amazing. There's obviously a lot more that needs to be done in prevention and research and public education and sex education in schools to achieve the global HIV target. Do you know what these targets are and how are you addressing those targets other than doing these programs? Yeah, I would love to share the targets is by the UNAs, the 2020 treatment targets. First 90 is 90% of all people living with HIV will know their HIV status. The second 90s is 90% of all people diagnosed with HIV infection will receive the sustained treatments. And the third 90 is the 90% of all people receiving the treatments will have the viral load suppressions. Right, okay. So, so, so those are the, the three so the tag 90s. targets. Okay. We haven't reached yet, I think in Hong Kong context, we haven't reached the target yet, so we're still working on the progress. Charmaine, how can the school and community education programs help reach these targets, do you think? I think that would be great if schools can adopt a more open-minded sex education. From what I know, some schools are still quite close-minded because of some certain cultural issue. The society has progressed a lot. We just hope that they adopt some newer strategy on sex education and that would be very helpful in terms of community i hope the community can understand more about aids and hiv and also give them opportunity if you are an employer if you are not if they are your colleagues embrace them and they are 
just polymers they're just they are just human beings and i learned from my study there's one very important concept is the label of patient is just part of the identity but their whole identity is more than that of the patient they could be a father a mother a student a colleague and you just don't look at the hiv itself look at beyond who he or who she is I think that's fantastic. That's a really great advice. And the other thing that we really need to think about more is diversity and inclusion. And we need to have more programs in school and in the community to raise awareness for different groups of people and create an understanding of difference. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. That would be definitely the topics of diversity and inclusion is a big partner in the corporate world. I understand that a lot of LGBT programs is ongoing in some of their HR departments. HIV can be part of it as well. Absolutely. I mean, that's what you were really saying before. It's about acceptance and understanding and treating people with respect and giving yeah. everyone equal respect, no matter what their medical status. Charmaine, what are your hopes for those living with HIV and AIDS in the future? I would hope that one day, the, with the advancement in tolerology, there will be a cure. Yeah. Yes, wouldn't that be great? Uh, I do really hope that's one day that would happen. That'd be great. Hope. And also the other hope would be that we get to the 90% in Hong Kong. Wouldn't yeah. that be great? Yeah. yeah, I would even dream about 2013, there will be no more HIV and AIDS. Yeah. But it needs a lot of collective effort for everybody to be in this part of the movement. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of that, how can members of the community support AIDS concern in Hong Kong? What can they do? That would be great if that they become our regular donor to support our great work we do all over the year. You can log on to our website, AIDS Concern, and become our regular donor. Fantastic. Charmaine, thank you so much for coming to talk to me about your work at AIDS Concern in Hong Kong. It's been such a lovely interview and so fascinating, and I'm so excited to share your knowledge with people in the community and my listeners, because it's so important that people have a really good understanding about HIV and AIDS and what they are and how it's transmitted and how we can all work together to break the stigma and discrimination against people living with HIV and AIDS. Thank you so much for coming on Hong Kong Confidential. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thanks. For my listeners out there, if this is a podcast that you've really enjoyed, please share it with your friends and family. It's such an important topic that we really need to educate others about. It'd be great if you can spread this podcast far and wide. And if you could go to Apple Podcasts to rate and review us, that will help me go up the iTunes charts and it will help people find AIDS concern in Hong Kong and get a greater understanding of the issues. Thanks again, Charmaine. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today and I really appreciate you giving me your time. Thank you. Hi, Confidants. I want to tell you about my Patreon page. I've joined Patreon in the hope of getting sponsorship for my Hong Kong Confidential podcast. Patreon is a great way for my listeners to get on board and sponsor me with monthly payments and that goes towards my production costs and rewards for my members. If you're interested in checking out my Patreon page, please go to patreon.com and search up Jules Hanford or Hong Kong Confidential. I would really appreciate you visiting my page. So that brings us to the end of another Hong Kong Confidential podcast. I'm Jules Hanford. Thanks for joining me. And I hope you'll be with me again next week. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please can you go to iTunes to rate and review it. I would really appreciate your feedback. You can email me at jules at hongkongconfidential.net and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Hong Kong Confidential. If you'd like to hit me up on Twitter, it's at Jules Hannaford. I would love to hear from you. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.